I think he started off. Uh, yes, it's already started. Uh, please continue. Okay. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good uh, morning, resource person, uh, Ms. Tripti Deo. Uh, Professor Mishra and uh, dear learners, my name is uh, Dr. Nakhat Shahin and I am working currently in Odisha State Open University as an academic consultant. So today uh, topic is uh, political structure in India and, uh, and the administrative and institutional structure we will uh, discuss. Yeah, here our resource person, Ms. Uh, Tripti Deo. And uh, let me tell about something about her that uh, she completed her uh, BA honors in history from Lady Shri Ram College and uh, MA in uh, her uh, specialized paper was uh, medieval Indian history from uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Her uh, MPhil is from uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. She has completed uh, in, on uh, 2009. And uh, she is having uh, lots of article publications and uh, lots of, and she attending also so many uh, workshop and uh, conferences. So we are uh, so much happy and uh, so grateful to having you, ma'am. And uh, she is going to present a topic on the administrative and institutional structure in peninsular India. Let me introduce the something a little bit about this topic that uh, this topic is uh, particularly about the the administrative and institutional structure which was evolved in the earliest time to the early medieval period that uh, the chief characteristics of the political formation in North India from the Vedic times to the early medieval periods have been traced, and the political structure got transformed from the chiefdoms to monarchical and oligarchical pattern, where the Mauryan Empire, regarded as uh, centralized by many historians, was followed by the decentralized polity, was followed by the decentralized polity in the Gupta and post-Gupta period. And uh, the administrative structure in South India in the earliest period was characterized by chiefdoms, but from the 6th century onwards, monarchical polities emerged. And in the Deccan, the earliest state formation took place under the Satavahana. The monarchical polities of peninsular India were generally regarded as decentralized polities, and the judicial system which prevailed in the medieval in in the prevailed in the period has been analyzed and uh, the relying on the authority of the dharma shastras so the peninsular india comprised the diverse topic but particularly the uh, topic topic but particularly the topological and climatic pattern of south india and the peninsula is in a uh, shape of a vast inverted triangle which is uh, bounded on the west by the Arabian Sea, on the east by the Bay of Bengal, and on the north by the Indian and South Pura range. And in, and in this uh, topic, we will also go through into the Sangam polity about the Pallavas, Pandyas, Cholas, and the studying the polity of uh, Sangam period. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, that uh, the Kural by Tiru Valluar. So, uh, uh, now I'm requesting uh, Ms. Tripti Deo, ma'am, to please uh, start the class. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaheen, for uh, you know uh, giving a brief about the topic. Good morning, everyone. So we meet again and on a different topic of discussion today. Let me just uh, straight away, because this particular topic is quite... Um, um, you know, vast and it is very, very descriptive. So I am going to touch upon some aspects of this particular uh, topic. 
and we will be covering almost uh, you know the entire indian subcontinent and i would like to you know show you uh, a couple of slides couple of maps and uh, uh, after you know through the, this discussion with the map and some pointers we will be going through uh, our lecture in the next one hour so um, i'm sure my slides are visible i've shared the screen with um, nishant if you could just tell me if my slide is visible uh yes ma'am yes, okay please. great so yes. uh, the topic as dr shaheen has already put forward it is political structures in india administrative and institutional structures and we welcome our um, ma history semester to students this will be this i whatever i have referred to is from the e resource which is available on your website university website uh, and this mhi04 uh, block 5 now the broad theme of this particular um, uh, period that uh, this particular uh, uh, the the topic uh, uh, which we will be covering from the earliest time to early medieval period so it's it's a broad framework that we will be looking at broad timeline that we'll be looking at and uh, under this uh, 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 topic the broad themes that we will be studying today in our lecture will be uh, administrative and institutional structures in peninsular india so i would request all of you to kind of keep um, in your mind the map of india and different regions and different locations that i'll be you know pointing out gradually but just keep visually keep your mind um, open to the map of um, india so the peninsular india will be will be looking at first that the second unit will study the north india part the north india the north indian belt and the third unit we will be looking at uh, will uh, will be um, on the law and judicial systems so these are three broad themes that we will be looking at the time frame that we are studying is from the earliest time to the early medieval so please keep that time frame in your mind we are not going to go beyond early medieval which is we are not going to go beyond the 7th century uh, we will not be going beyond the uh, 10th century maybe you know early medieval is um, about the 9th or the 10th century so let's look at the um, you know the the first unit and in the first unit like i said we will be covering the peninsular india the structures in the peninsular india um um we will be taking a look at the cholas pandyas and cheras i've already shared this map uh, previously also in one of my lectures in my first lecture that i gave on the 19th of this month um please look at the cheras which are on the western um, Uh, the western coast and the cholas who are which are in the eastern coast eastern the southeastern and the southwestern and the pandyas which are in the southern coast southern so uh, keep this um, area in mind when i'm talking about the sangam polity per se uh, especially and also when we'll be looking at the cholas who becomes uh, who became dominant you know by the 9th century ad um but sangam polities these are the three moventas that i've already also mentioned previously we will also be uh, looking at the polity of pallava pallavas became very very powerful now if you look at pallavas pallavas are almost uh, coinciding with the regions of pandyas and chola see this is the pallava territory uh, look at the the pink um, shaded in the map the pallavas with their capital at kanchi can you look at uh, if you look at the south eastern part of um, not south is in fact the south the southern part of um, the kanchi the area of kanchi velor kaveri river on so tungabhadra river so this is the pink belt is the pallava territory the pallava kingdom uh, which became pro pro prominent in the 7th century and of course uh, defeating the pallavas the cholas became uh, the the cholas not of the sangam but the cholas of the post sangha made in the 9th century they become very very dominant in the south indian polity in the peninsula region uh let's straight away look at the administrative and institutional structures in peninsula india now as i had told you the sangam polity um uh, comprises primarily of the moventa the three crown kings of the cheras pandyas and cholas and if you look at their um, you know the seat of power if you look at their seat of power urayur madurai in this map um you know the uh, the pandyas the korak korakai so all of these regions kaveri uh, patnam uh, and nagapatnam uh, for the cholas now these are important regions so the seat of power um, for uh, all these uh, uh, kingdoms under the moventa the cheras pandyas and the cholas were located uh, at very very critical tr uh, strategic locations so the earliest political formation of the peninsular india my first point in this slide 
uh, begins um, in the Sangam period. And the main source of this particular period is the Sangam literature, archaeology, numismatics, and travelers' account. Now, if you look at Sangam polity, we did not have a, a ruler or a king. They were clans and they were chiefs of the clans. Now, who, these chiefs, um, clan chiefs, were involved in the welfare, accumulation of wealth in form of booty, redistribution of the wealth, etc. So the chief held a central place. Now, there's a difference between a chief and a ruler, and we will see that during our course of lecture. But Sangam polity was characterized by a chief who acquired a central place. And of course, uh, one has looked at uh, the, uh, the sources. And when one looks at the Sangam sources, one, uh, one sees that there's a description of the ecological zones, which are called Tinai. And all of these ecological zones, the regions described in Tinai, um, are based on uh, have agrarian, pastoralists, and interregional and long distance trade. So these are some of the features of the region. And um, all of these, the pastoral, agrarian trade, all of this helped the uh, Muventar, the, 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 the kingdoms of Cheras, Pandyas, Cholas to establish their polity in the Sangam period. Moving forward to the Pallavas, I've already shown you the map. Let me just show you the map of Pallavas again, the pink region in the south part with their capital at Kanchi. They emerged in the 7th century AD. Now, they emerged as a result of a process of agrarian expansion the class of intermediaries and in this process of agrarian when i say agrarian expansion that means that more land was brought under cultivation more land so whatever all land cannot be cultivated some land every land has different qualities the, the soil has different qualities so the main aim of the ruler is that more and more land whatever type it may be should be brought under cultivation now if it is brought under cultivation what happens it brings revenue to the state. People settle there. The region is being utilized well. So the agrarian expansion leads to dynamic developments in the political formation of any region. So in the process of agrarian expansion, the class of intermediaries also acquired superior rights over the land as representatives of the king. Okay. When I say class of intermediaries, now please pay attention. This class of intermediaries that are between the king, between the ruler, or between the chief and the people. All right. So they start playing very, very important role uh, in the political formation or the polity, or in the administrative and institutional structures of different, different of different regions and kingdoms. Now, to start with, the Brahmins had played a very significant role in the expansion of Pallava rule. Uh, because they were given Brahmadeya. So Brahmadeya are land grants that were given to Brahmins. We will look at Brahmadeya a little more in detail in, in due course of my lecture. Agrarian system, predominantly Brahmadeya, tempic, temple centric. So uh, uh, Brahmadeya, the lands that were given to Brahmins and temples were also given, and Brahm Brahmins generally stayed around the temple area. All right. So if you look at the Jagannath temple also in Puri, if you look at, you know, the Puri city is called the temple city. So Brahmins are living inside that city. If you look at the temple also, the temple has ring of um, uh, uh, it around the temple. It's like a ring, you know, different Brahmins of different hierarchies and workers are staying around that temple. So what happens in, in gradually? There's a temple and then there are Brahmins staying around. So it becomes and these Brahmins are also given Brahmadeya lands. That means the land is granted to them to settle, to live there. So Brahmadeya temple centric, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Brahmadeya temple centric system was something that worked and was a, a dominant feature of the Pallava period. The rulers sought legitimacy through claims to mythical genealogies. So especially Pallavas claimed their genealogies from the Chandravamsis. They thought of themselves as uh, from the Bharadwaj Gotra. So uh, they, they tried to don the characteristics of both Brahma and Kshatriya status. So if you look at Brahma Kshatra status, they were also, um, they considered themselves as custodians of Varnashrama Dharma. Yes, and they adopted high sounding titles like Maharaja Dirar, Dharma, Dharma Maharaja, election of the king. The king was elected and uh, there was a proper coronation ceremony that was important during the Pallava period. Um, moreover, in the Pallava period, we get a lot of information from inscriptions 
and they tell us about uh, the officials who were notified uh, for Ramadhyaya Grant and uh, they were given um, the positions uh, uh, by the Pallava king. These officials were called Amatyas. Now you will hear of this word Amatyas again and again in my lecture. This is a word used for officials working for the state. All right now their their uh, portfolios or whatever they are doing may be different but they are high ranking officials of the state they were also matras ministers who were assigned um, revenue uh, and the all of these people the brahma the amatyas the matras they were assigned revenue as remuneration so um, cash was there monetization of economy was there but land and revenue of the land was assigned as remuneration uh, you know at this point of time uh, ministers and feudatories they played extremely important role in the election and coronation process of the of the chief uh, land was measured Measured. And land grants were given to Brahmans, Brahmans who are, which are called the Brahmadeya grants, the Hindu temples, Hindu temples, which were called the Devadana grant, and to the votaries of other beliefs, which were called the Palikkandan. So these were categorizations of land grants that were given by the Pallava uh, ruler in the 7th century AD, you know, uh, to, ex to expand and the primary role of giving land grants was, of course, they were given in lieu of uh, uh, one service as a remuneration, but it helped in settling people. It helped in bringing more land under agrarian cultivation. It helped in uh, helping the ruler or a chief to settle its population. Yes, the army comprised of four parts uh, of the Pallavas, um, Pallavan army. Uh, it was Ratha, Gaj, Juraka, and Patati, which are chariots, elephants, horses, and foot soldiers, respectively. They made extensive use of elephants, and we see this from a lot of inscriptional and other kind of uh, sources that we have of that period. Mahavamsa, which is a Buddhist text from Sri Lanka, it mentions incursions of Pallavas into Sri Lankan territory in Sri Lanka in the 7th century AD. So there were several conflicts between Pallavas and Pandyas also. And all of this, we get information from the primary sources, like the inscriptional sources, the literature of that period, you know, the, the uh, so uh, uh, numismatics, epigraphical, the inscriptional sources. Um, provincial administration was also um, structured by the Pallavas and it was headed by Yuva Maharaja. The lowest level of administration comprised of the villages. Sabha was the village assembly. Nadu was larger than a village. Assembly of a Nadu were Natar, Urar and Alvar. Unit bigger than Nadu was Kottam. Land was a primary resource and its produce was taxed. So if you look at uh, you know this point, the third point of my slide, there are a lot of names that I've taken and you'll have to remember them. You'll have to know their meanings because these are terminologies that we get straight from the sources. This is the lingua that is used in the sources. That's the language of the sources and that's the language of the people there. So um, uh, you'll have to remember what Nadu, what um, Kottam and what the land tax is called. So and it's not difficult once you read the resource a couple of times you will already be acquainted with them the brahmadaya and devadana grants were tax-free talked together with certain other prerequisites so and you already know now what are the brahmadaya the land that is land grants given to the brahmins and the devadanas were given to hindu temples um, and they were tax-free the brahmins and the temple did not have to pay tax to the state you know from this land a land grant Initially, it was granted by king or the queen, but by the 7th century, Brahmins were granted land to settle in various areas. Large Brahmadeya emerged. So, like I said in my previous point, Brahmins played a very important role in the state political formation of Pallavas because these Brahmins were given Brahmadeya, the land grants, and through this land grants, various areas in the Pallava regions were settled. They were brought under cultivation. Okay, so let's also look at the Pandeyas. The, they rose to power in the valleys of River Vagai uh, the, and Tamdrapani. Their expansion and growth of, again, it was dependent on the expansion and growth of agrarian economy. And the Pandeyas were known for development of irrigation works. They traced their lineage to Chandravamsa origin. Uh, the Pandeyas Prasastis, Prasastis are copper plate inscriptions. They connect them to Mahabharat. And they also, uh, Pandyas were known to have established 
the Tamil Sangam. If you look at uh, my lecture on the sang Sangam literature, the Sangam period, which I gave on the 19th, you get an idea of what I'm talking about now. Uh, trace their lineage, the, uh, the, 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 the Pandyas trace their lineage to local and Sanskritic traditions. So Pandyas are not only looking at uh, a mythology in the past, but they also trace the lineage to the local tradition, the local tradition there in that region. The records do not refer to a council of minister or a court, but they do refer to terms like mantrins and uttara mantrins. There's also no clear cut division between civil and military functions. Army was under a commander, but sometimes the king himself provided leadership. So these are some of the administrative and institutional dynamics of the uh, Pandyan uh, uh, rulers. The administrative divisions were Nadu, Kuram and Rastra. Gramam was the basic unit of local administration. This is the village. Nadu was the larger unit of local administration. Land grants were bestowed by kings and they were called Danam or Dana. Brahmadeya and various rights on these grants were also given. So when a land grant was given, there were many rights that were also given to the people, the grantee, the revenue. Uh, so some of these rights were that cultivation had to be done. There were also administrative rights that were given. Yes, uh, there were also in these administrative divisions, village assemblies and membership was uh, at this point of time, the membership of these assemblies was based on property and learning. So somebody has a, uh, someone has a certain uh, qualified property, a certain qualified proper, uh, property and is learned, was given um, uh, admission to these village assemblies uh, easily. These assemblies were not elected bodies. Okay. Um, land under Pallavas was cultivated uh, and cultivated land was only subjected to taxation. So only cultivated land. Some taxes uh, are like Kadamani on temple lands. Antarayan, Viniyogam, now these are land taxes. So they were mostly paid in kind. Like I told you, cash nexus was there, monetization of economy is there, but then uh, mostly um, taxes are taken in kind. Inscriptions also indicate at harassment faced by peasants, by officials or incursions of petty chiefs. So these kind of conflicts are also uh, quite visible in our inscriptional sources at, during the Pandyan period. Now, going to the Cholas, they rose to prominence in the 9th century AD. Now, I've already shown you that um, Cholas were, um, let me quickly show you the map again. See, this is the area of Cholas that I'm talking about. Um, on the right uh, uh, side of your uh, map, the, the eastern, no, southeastern part of um, the um, India. Now, the Cholas rose to prominence in 9th century AD. Now, there's a difference between the Sangam Cholas and the Cholas that I'm talking about in the 9th century AD. Okay, this is, these are the Cholas who, were, uh, who came into prominence in the 9th century AD. Now, uh, they established control over the Pallava territories. You must have seen that in the map and subdued the Pand Pandian power also. Derived strength from resource pocket located in fertile Kaveri Valley. So let me go back to the map again. The Cholas are a pa uh, are located at a very fertile area of the Kaveri Valley. Okay, and this particular uh, region, because of its fertility and re good resource base, um, kind of uh, uh, gain uh, uh, gain strength from the region. And um, tra they trace the, the Cholas uh, trace their origin from the Surya Vamsa. And they claim Itihasic and Puranic traditions both. Um, Cholas already have legacy in the Sangam period. So I've already mentioned that the Sangam Cholas were already there. But these Cholas also uh, uh, take uh, lineage or legacy from the Sangam Cholas. The Cholas of the 9th century take legacy from the, draw their legacy from the uh, Sangam Cholas. Uh, actual motive of making land grants was redistribution of resources in form of land, gold, cattle, etc. So through these grants, uh, King tried to convert unsettled areas into agrarian settlement. Now, this is the point I'm trying to bring to your attention again and again. That King, through these land grants, is trying to convert unsettled areas into agrarian settlements. So grants were not simply a charitable purpose for charitable purpose. It was for a very practical, political, administrative purpose. Okay, 
Natar was the representative of a Nadu. Nadu was a locality. Now again and again, I've been using this word Nadu. Please familiarize yourself with this word. The head of the Nadu was called Natar. Nagaratar comprised of trading community. Nagaratar was the head of the trading community. And they settled themselves in the Nagaram. Their settlements were called Nagaram, the trading settlements. Ur was the group of an assembly of non Brahmin landholders of the village. So, again, new terms that I've used are Natar, Ur, Nagatar, Nagaratar, and Nagaram. Nadu was a natural collection of peasant settlements incorporated into the Chola state system. Um, now, Chola state system draw its legacy from the peri previous periods, the Sangam Cholas. Um, Nadu was also there at that point of time. The word Nadu is also used by the Sangam Cholas. The Valanadus, uh, as an administrative body uh, division, uh, came into existence in the period of Raja Raja I. Okay. Nadus initially uh, were given in fertile areas, but we see gradually the Nadus also spreading to comparatively less fertile zones. As in, as in when the agrarian settlements or the agrarian uh, cultivation started in different regions, agrarian economy expanded. Um, uh, it was because of the Nadus, the Nadus or the grants that uh, the Nadus that were established on the grants that were given in less fertile areas. Okay, Nadu was the smallest unit for revenue administration. Most Brahmadeyas or the Brahmin settlements centered around the temple, and they were Brahmins were the means to legitimize power. So, in the peninsula of India, you will see the Brahmins playing a very, very important role in legitimation of power of the ruler in both the political development and also establishing administrative and institutional frameworks for the ruler. After the 11th century per se AD, there were few Brahmadeya tracts and more temples were constructed and older ones were improved on. Nagaram settlements was a separate area. In some cases, Nagaram were independent of Nadu. That means that Nagaram had its own rules and regulations, own uh, uh, local officials who were collecting revenue and taxes. So I told you Nagaram were specifically settlements that were of the trading community. And the head of the trading community is the Nagarattar. Yes. No clear, the last point in my slide, no clear evidence of a council of minister, but Udan Kotam seemed to serve this purpose. There's a term institution called Udan Kotan, institutional framework that worked like a council of ministers. They made it preliminary stages of a council of ministers. They were both op upward and downward mobility noticeable in the administrative hierarchy. Officials paid uh, 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 by um, giving land rights, revenue rights. Tax on the land was levied in both cash and kind. It was collected both in cash and kind. Taxes were collected in both kind and cash, more in kind. There were also communal ownership and justice was carried out by village assemblies through committees. Officers also were deputed at Nadus on behalf of the king. They were called Nadu Vagai. Now, again, a new term. Nadu Vagai were officers that were deputed on the behalf of the king. And these were revenue assessment officers. So especially during Raja Raja 1, he adopted an elaborate land revenue fixation and assessment mechanism. And uh, he also introduced the Valanadus, Valanadus, another administrative division of the um, of his of his region. Uh, this practice was adopted by other rulers as well. So we see the use of the administrative division of Valanadu continuing. That it started during Raja Raja One. Uh, it continued uh, in, uh, uh, after him also by the other his successor successive rulers. Cholas undertook military expeditions to Sri Lanka and they had they had a very strong military strength. So, in fact, your e-resource discusses a lot on Cholas and cites a lot of primary references. And I would really encourage all of you to kind of look at these um, uh, primary documents that the, 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 your e-resource highlights on the Cholas. Uh, keep looking at the map so that you keep looking visually have an, um, uh, you have an imagination of the region at least through your map. Um, after looking at the Sangam polity, the Polcholas, the Pandyas, um, and the Pallavas, let's look at also the administrative system in Deccan. So just above the peninsula region is the Deccan area, which ha which primarily had, which also had many, many smaller kingdoms. Um, one of them was Satvahanas, and I'll show you this in the map later. But let me just focus right now on bringing some um, uh, points on the Satvahana administration. 
Now, Satvanas were um, earliest in state formation per se. So, up till now, we know of chiefs, clans, you know, small uh, kings and rulers. But a proper state formation was seen during the Satvahana period, under the Satvahanas. They were uh, the major part of the kingdom was under royal officers, and some portions were also controlled by feudatories. Yes, feud we'll see what these feudatories are gradually. The administrative division of Satvahana were aharas or rashtra, which contained towns. Towns were referred to as nigam. And villages that were re referred to as gram. There were other officers in the Satvahana uh, uh, records that we find. The names are Mahamatra, Bhandagarika, Mahasenapati, Lekhaka. Lekhaka was a person who kept records. Senapati, of course, is person Mahasenapati responsible for army. Bhandagarika is the person who is um, responsible for the the bhandar, the treasury, and the the granary of the uh, and Mahamatra are the high uh, ranking officials of uh, take, uh, taking care of different departments of the of the um, of, of, of the Satvahana administration. We also have the Chalukyas of Badami um, and uh, their rule were also not centralized. Village was the smallest unit and uh, the Mahajan word we see Mahajan constituted the village elders. We also have references to Rashtrakutas. Rashtrakutas is very, very important. Um, the western part of uh, India, we see the um, uh, the develop the uh, the the coming up of the Rashtrakutas. Administrative system was again not centralized. Kingdoms under royal officials as well as feudatories. Feudatories were paid regular tribute. Uh, uh, feudatories had to pay regular tribute to the suzerain. So the reign was the main king. So um, um, uh, the Rashtrakuta ruler, he, that had to that Rashtrakuta ruler had to be paid certain tribute by these feudatories. They uh, rendered the feudatories rendered military services. Um, officer in charge of the Rashtra who was called Rashtrapati. Now the political formations in the system in the administrative systems in Deccan emerge around the river valleys that served as economic resource base. So if you look at um, uh, uh, the map, and let me just show you maybe, um, yeah. So if you look at the Satvahanas here, Satvahana Empire, and uh, the Rashtrakutas is not mentioned here. The Satvahana Empire on the, in the Deccan, if you see, it's 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 in the green, written in green. And uh, don't look at anything else right now, but just focus on your uh, on your eyes on Satvahana Empire. Also, the the Rashtrakutas we will see are broadly in the present regions of Gujarat and Maharashtra. This this particular belt, so it's not uh, there in this map. Um, but uh, just to see that in one of the other maps from the Google, maybe. Now, these, these political formations emerge around river valleys, and these, uh, this rich river valley area served as economic resource base for these smaller kingdoms that emerged at this point of time in Deccan. They were constant agrarian expansion because of revenue was most important for the state to run. Royal power was sought through legitimacy. Various methods uh, were used to legitimize power by the ruler. King had a bureaucratic machinery. King had to have officials, feudatories, who, uh, and there was a system in that uh, bureaucracy also, a particular official hierarchy that had to be maintained. And this is how the administrative system in Deccan functioned. So we've looked at um, some of the systems in both um, uh, uh, in the peninsula of India, Sangam polity, Pallavas, the Pandyas, the Cholas, and the uh, administrative system in Deccan. So this is broadly from the earliest period to about the early medieval period, or the 10th century or so AD. Uh, let's now look at um, you know the let's go to the North Belt, Northern India. Uh, after moving after moving. Uh, after looking at Peninsular and the Deccan region, let's look at what was happening to the administrative and inst institutional areas in uh, northern India. And let me show you through a couple of maps which regions that we will be looking at. Um, uh, uh, the Vedic period, of course, we don't have. Um, uh, uh, we have more information from the scriptures and uh, Vedic sources. Uh, but after that, uh, the growth of the Janapadas in the 6th century BC, um, uh, the, if you look at the Mahajanapadas in this map, now clearly look at these shaded colorful areas, the Kuru, Matsya, Surasena, Panchala, Kosala, 
ಮಗದ ಕಾಶಿ ಮಲ್ಲ ಅಂಗ ಅವಂತಿ ಕಂಬೋಜ ನಾ ದಿ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದೀಸ್ ರೀಜನ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಪ್ರೈಮರಿಲಿ ಇನ್ ದಿ ನಾರ್ತ್ ಗಂಗೋ ಗಂಗಾ ಬೆಲ್ಟ್ ದ ಗಂಗಾ ಯಮುನಾ ಯು ನೋ ಬೆಲ್ಟ್ ದ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ನಾರ್ದರ್ನ್ ಬೆಲ್ಟ್ ದ ನಾರ್ದರ್ನ್ ಗಂಗಾ ಬೆಲ್ಟ್ ವೇರ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದೀಸ್ ಕಿಂಗ್ಡಮ್ ದ ಜನಪದಾಸ್ ದ ಮಹಾ ಜನಪದಾಸ್ ಇಮರ್ಜ್ಡ್ and of them magadha uh, the present patna and the rajagriha the old capital of uh, the region uh, was the most important so just take a look at uh, briefly look at this map that we will be discussing this region the administrative and institutional areas in this um i've taken this from the wikipedia so you can go back to seeing the map there um we'll also study the administrative and institutional framework of the mauryan dynasty that came in on the 3rd century bc now when i uh, just so this entire shaded region in is the modern dynasty and it's of course pretty famous uh, and popularly studied when you study about the ancient ancient india so i would like you to focus on a couple of regions first the capital of modern dynasty which was patliputra again the present patna bihar now also look at um, uh, tamralipti down below um, uh, patliputra now the, the uh, mauryan dynasty had four different um, four important uh, uh, points um, the regions that were almost treated as separate four uh, four uh, in, in the different four divisions in uh, uh, in different four directions so remember um, ujjaini the the if you look at ujjain ujjaini the the center part of india ujjaini look at taksila the northern part, most point uh take a look at uh, swarangiri swarangiri is um the present karnataka and um, this particular region swarangiri and toshali toshali of course you know is uh, a present day odisha so toshali swarangiri ujjaini and taksila these are four important centers of the modern uh, period modern dynasty and of course the capital is um, uh the patliputra uh moving forward uh, when we look at the post modern period uh, there were there was there were a lot of um, invasions that were happening at this point of time by different groups of people we have the greco bactrian kingdom coming from the northwest part of uh, northwestern uh, part of the world the north part western part of india um uh, above that we also have um, you know uh, sunga empire satvahana so we all of this especially the satva the the, the satvahanas and uh, uh, the kushanas the greek or uh, roman um, uh, uh, attacks that happened at this point of time so just look at uh, there's a lot happening in post modern period maybe you can singularly look at the expansion the the regions of kushana and uh, satvahana in different maps but i just try to bring some regions in through this map and uh, finally we'll be looking at the gupta and the vakatakas um, in the fourth and the sept, uh, from fourth what fourth century to seventh century ad now the gupta kingdom this is the entire map of india especially in the northern belt and the vakatakas in the deccan and uh, the um, no, uh, the some parts of the early uh, the peninsula region so vakatakas so these two important region uh, kingdoms become they become important um, in the early um, in the late ancient period and uh, yes and it continues to be in the 7th century ad so with these three maps in four maps in mind the janapadas the modern dynasty the post modern period and the guptas and vakatakas let's uh, uh, move to studying about administrative and institutional systems in the north india now uh, in the north india uh, beginning from the vedic times um, they were the earliest earliest traces of complex administrative system can be seen in the mature harappan civilization so i'm bring i'm taking you really back to uh, the harappan civilization and harappan civilization the mature harappan civilization from about 2600 to 1750 bc we see impressive administrative and institutional frameworks there high standards of civic life urban layout standardized weights and measure system uniformity in its material culture 
Now, because the script of Indus Valley civilization, the Harappan civilization, is still not known to us, so we cannot really find out about the, um, different mechanisms of administrative and institutional systems at this point in, in this particular period. But through archaeological and other um, material um, uh, sources, we have been able to see that there were high standards of you know administrative uh, frameworks that um, a mature Harappan period had um, witnessed. The Rig Vedic period uh, from 1500 to 1000 BC, we also have very little information, primarily from the Vedic sources, especially the Rig Vedic um, Raja was not a full fledged Raja, he was more of a chief or a, uh, of a clan. And society was a combination of pastoralist and agriculturist. Um, there were regular wars, and these wars were for cattle, not for territorial expansion. The cattle is often called as the, to control cattle. The term used is called is kavishti. The later Vedic texts, from which were from written around the 1000 to 500 BC, uh, we have earliest references to some assistance to the Vedic ruler. So there are, there, there are a group of people helping the Vedic ruler. And there are terms used like bejeweled ones, the Ratnins. So among them, Senapati, Bhagaduga, Akshva, Akshvapa. So these were uh, some officials or assistants who were helping the Vedic ruler. Now, these are at a very preliminary stage, very, very raw stage of um, uh, administrative framework. So let's not see them as a modern day uh, military commanders and all. Let's go back in time and understand them from that perspective only definitely they were not regular administrative officers um, uh, levy on agriculture produce was there but uh, however we don't see a regular revenue demand the rate of bali bali is an agricultural produce the term used bali for agricultural produce was not fixed bali was not fixed and there were possible absence of a regular standing army okay this is about the later vedic text so Vedic polity overall can be seen as a proto-state. That means, yes, there were uh, beginnings of fledglings of uh, administrative and institutional frameworks. They were not properly formalized. They were proto-state. In Vedic literature, there were importance uh, also given to three popular assemblies, the Vidhata, Sabha, and Samiti. And I'm sure our uh, uh, students of the second semester who are uh, looking at our lecture today um, would have looked at Vidhata, Sabha, and Samiti uh, when they were studying about the Vedic period. Um, uh, these, in, these assemblies saw popular participation. So we see that there was popular participation in this period. And this um, feature of popular participation continued in the post Vedic period also. Now, uh, I had shared with you a couple of minutes back the map of Mahajanapadas, the Janapadas and Mahajanapadas that emerged in the 6th century um, BC, 6th century to, um, and uh, these were advents of territorial states. So now each, let me go back to the map, each Janapada, like the shaded region, like the pink shaded region or the orange shaded region, the yellow shaded, shaded region of the Panchala, so the blue shaded region of Surasena. Now, these were territorially uh, under one clan. Kurus had a, a certain territory under them. So, therefore, I'm using this word territorial states. I did not use this word territorial states or territories before uh, beginning with Mahajanapadas. Yes, the advent of territorial states we see with the beginning of Mahajanapadas, monarchical, they were both monarchical and non-monarchical, non-monarchical as in oligarchies or chiefdoms. And monarchical, of course, you understand with heading, uh, uh, with a ruler heading the entire region. Now, monarchies revolved around the king who had accepted, accepted the throne by the virtue of being born in a particular ruling house. So there was already a concept of dynastic succession that was prevalent uh, in the monarchies that, uh, that came up in during this period. Uh, they ruled over a praja or a population on a specific territory, which was called Janapad. Some of them were strong and formidable, like Magadha, Avanti, Koshala, Ujjaini. You know, you can see them in the map. Uh, they had strong regular armies with which they subjugated their lesser contemporaries. Well, sources talk about constant fights between these regions, these territorial kingdoms, and they were trying to subjugate each other and you know take over their territories. They were regular administrators for management of the state. 
So example, uh, Vasakara and Sunidha were high ranking functionaries of the Magadha Mahajanpada under King Ajat Shatru. Now, uh, coming to non-monarchical uh, uh, kingdoms, uh, non-monarchical, um, uh, uh, which were also the chiefdoms, there were many, uh, about four or five of them, like the Sakya clan. Now, what is the feature of non-monarchical uh, system? It had no single ruler, but for example, the Sakya clan had almost 7,707 Rajas. They were all Kshatriya chiefs. Now, the matters of administration and politics were openly discussed. These are small territories and matters on uh, uh, debates were uh, uh, taking, taken, uh, they, they were, they, they were taking place. There were discussions on politics in the Ganarajya. Ganarajya is the term used for non-monarchical uh, regions, states like Vajji in their assembly halls. They also had commander of fighting forces, Senapati. So there was no bureaucratic structure as such because, of course, um, uh, we, this is a non-monarchical setup. But they were a head of a, there was a commander of the fighting force because there were all these non-monarchical um, regions were also fighting amongst each other. So the, 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 the commander of fighting force was the Senapati was an important um, person in their clan. The importance of administrators and functionaries during this period is recognized by Kautilya, Kautilya's Arthashastra. Uh, Kautilya wrote uh, this very, very important, significant work, Arthashastra. Uh, I'm sure all of you know of that. The, uh, according to Arthashastra, the state composed of seven elements of which most important was the ruler, the Swami. And the second was Amatya. The administrator or an officer of the state. I'm, I'm repeating this word amatya. I've spoken about this uh, the term amatya in while I was discussing the peninsular India uh, administrative framework. Amatya had to be appointed on the basis of four tests according to Kautilya's Arthashastra, and these tests were based on deception, tests of deception. Uh, relating to money, fear, lust, and righteousness. So they were tests, uh, and the person qualifying test overcoming the the, the greed of money, fear, and lust, and proof their and proof whoever proved their righteousness uh, were appointed in the uh, to uh, the position of amatya. So there was a also first attempt at gradation of administrative offices on the basis of differentiated salary structure. Now, another um, uh, list of about 18 highest administrators is also mentioned in the Arthashastra um, uh, uh, by Kautilya uh, during the Janapada period, the Mahajanapadas. Moving forward, now the administrative of more of administration of more is the Maurya uh, 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 literally were a Mauryan empire. Yeah, so if you look at the map of um, the modern dynasty, almost the entire India. Except for covering the Cholas and the Brahmaputra, uh, the northeast Brahmaputra region, but Mauryas were ruling on the entire uh, India. Um, and uh, well, let's see what their administration was like. So it was a pan-Indian empire, and capital was Patliputra, Patna, present-day Patna. Now we have the, the many. Um, um, primary sources that we have for understanding the modern period. Greek accounts of Megasthenes and Kautilya's Arthashastra uh, uh, most importantly throws light on the administration. And there are possibility of central and provincial administration. So now we see the beginning of the center and center, the, um, uh, the, the one center and the provinces under that. So divisions of the, of the entire region into different provinces. So the central and the provincial administration for the first time. The central administrative machinery was effective in the metropolitan, the Magadh region, and the core areas located in the Ganga plain. So let me explain this through the map. So the Ganga region, the, the northern Ganga belt, the present UP, Bihar, Bengal, um, and Magadh, um, uh, uh, the, the Patliputra region. So this entire northern belt is the core area, um, the capital and the core area, which um, was uh, uh, which had the most effective administrative machinery under the Mauryas. Um, the rulers took simple titles and they had they uh, worked as paternalistic rulers. Uh, they considered their uh, themselves as a uh, father, the, the patron, the, uh, the father-like figure to its subjects, the people. 
ruler was the head of all executive functions of the realm the principal functionaries directly appointed and responsible to the ruler so there was direct um, appointment by the ruler that started taking place and that functionary was also responsibly responsible um, directly to the ruler so the kautilya recommends appointment of full fledged ministers ashokan edicts do not mention about any mora minister ashokan uh, ashoka in rather instructs messengers to inform if if any conflict among the members of the parishad parishad may be a deliberative body and ashoka uh, has a system of messengers uh, and uh, instructs them that if there is any conflict among uh, the people in parishad he should be informed of that conflict arthashastra also talks about departmental heads adhyakshas um megasthenes also informs us of um uh, counselors and assessors the highest rank officers of ashoka were mahamatras now mahamatras were highest ranking officers and they were taking care of different departments uh, we know more about the dhamma mahamatras but dhamma mala mahamatras were taking care of the dhamma the religious belief of ashoka and the spread of uh, the that particular uh, uh, of dhamma but there were mahamatras of other departments or other administrative functions also they were high ranking officers So at least four units of army. Army was the most important component of the modern empire, modern state. Infantry, cavalry, chariots, and elephant forces. These are four important units of the army. Megasthenes accounts suggest about six lakh soldiers. Also reports of a navy uh, that was maintained by Mauryas. There was also strong espionage system, the secret service. There were collection of regular taxes. Cotelia suggests seven heads of revenue, and you can take a look at uh, the details of these revenue from your e-resource. Of these, the most important was the uh, uh, revenue coming from the agrarian sector. At least two agricultural taxes were collected: bhaga or the share, which was possibly the one sixth or the uh, of or the one fourth of the uh, agrarian produce. and bali so these are um, some of the aspects of revenue administration in the army uh, coming to the provincial system in uh, it was for the first time introduced in history there were four provincial headquarters i've already mentioned on the map taxila ujjaini tosali and suvarnagiri so let me quickly show you that uh, on the map taxila the near gandhara on the northern part ujjaini uh, the uh, the center part of india to sali would you all of you would know about it the present day bhubaneswar uh, near bhubaneswar uh, near uh, in present day orissa and suvarnagiri the deccan part the peninsula region yes uh, the present day karnataka region so uh yes so yes so there were four important uh, cardinal and they were all in four cardinal direction strategic to mauryas the mauryas i'm looking at the last uh, line of my last uh, point in the slide the mauryas also appointed people to different important positions even from outside royal family so we also have references of appointments of iranis um uh, provinces were further divided into districts that were called aharas so uh, if you look at modern administration it was quite formalized and quite um, effective and that's how they could take uh, centralized control over the entire region and of course the provincial administration really helped provincial the system of provincial administration helped in proper functioning of the state looking at the post modern period and i would um, uh, quickly like to show you the map that i had referred this is the post modern period Moreans are uh, disintegrated. There were many rulers coming in from outside the Greco-Bactrian kingdom, the Satvahanas, and all. So let's look at what's happening in this period. Period. The emergence of several states in the post-modern period and political powers in Indian subcontinent like Greek, Sakas, Kushanas. So there was no single paramount power. There was also advent of monarchical states in the peninsular India for the first time. Uh, there was growing power of the king. Use of several grandiose political epithets like Akarat, the sole ruler, Raja Diraj, the king of the kings. The Bactrian key Greek rulers introduced their royal portraiture on their coins, visual representations of might of the ruler. 
performances of vedic sacrifices like ashwamedha vajapya and rajasuya yagya so uh, you see that how uh, the ruler uh, is now becoming more and more important and he is taking grandiose political epithets he is legitimizing his power through his uh, his, his picture in in the coin he is legitimizing power through um, uh, uh, sacrifices like vedic sacrifices uh, uh, what does legitimizing power means i i'm i'm sure students are able to understand legitimizing power means uh, legitimizing power means that um, the ruler is trying to uh, uh, prove that he's a good ruler he's 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 um, sanctifying his power through different mechanism that he is supposed to rule he is trying to show that and he is a good ruler he is trying to get that that um, uh, certificate you can say from uh, um, doing uh, ceremonies like ashwamedha vajapya these were ceremonies that were uh, sacrifices that were uh, done by the uh, clan chiefs of the ved uh, of, of the ruler the kings in the vedic period so um, maurya the post modern period the rulers of the kushana the greco rulers uh, the the sakas they are um, they are actually legitimizing their power through various ceremonies and uh, processes of legitimation there are also claims to divinity of the king like the devaputra is a title that kushana ruler take the representation of kushana ruler many uh, representations of kushana ruler especially in their coins you will see that there's a halo behind them that shows their divinity uh, the power that they derive from god supposedly so the cult of ruler why was this cult of ruler a good ruler being created because it acted as a cementing factor amidst amidst diversities so they were trying to establish themselves the ruler is trying to establish themselves within a population among people who were diverse who were from different backgrounds the ruler is trying to show that i am the strongest i am capable of ruling you so he is taking these important steps to prove his validity to rule so it helped in him in integrating the vastness of his empire the vast empire and dynastic dynastic succession began to become a norm the third point of my slide uh, is that the burden of administration was assigned to high ranking functionaries like the amatya many of them were appointed in the core territory of the satvahana realm in the western and central deccan organization of army became very important and the army came to be a part of a very important part of the central administration the commander in chief of the army was the senapati and there was the importance of secret agents yeah the spies the espionage system you know really uh, became very very significant uh, at this point of time the post modern period the collection of revenue was a major concerns and terms like bhaga shulk is 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 seen uh, in the primary sources that is referred to as revenue levies were also imposed like levies on salt mahabharat recommends uh, increase in the demand of revenue the mahabharat is an epic text it, uh, it recommends that uh, a lot of revenue should be taken demanded from by should be demanded by the state from its people the concept of appointment of kshatraps the provincial governors by the kushana rulers and this concept of kshatraps especially comes from the academic 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 empire of iran so i think my map shows the academics yes so uh, i think previous yes so you can see the academic empire the present um, uh, the the iranian and the the afghanistan area uh, the above the northwestern part the kushanas had come in from there so that we see a lot of influence of the kushanas um they see the greco bactrian kingdom coming from alexandria for so the all of these uh, 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 the alexandria and the caucasus alexandria they are so all of these um, the especially the the kushanas were coming from this region so they were familiar with the system of provincial governor the the kshatra they, they introduced this concept in india also now the administration from 300 to 600 ad there were two important monarchical powers and uh, there were guptas in the north india and the vakatakas in north and central parts of deccan let me take you through the map the gupta kingdom in the northern belt and the vakatakas uh, in the deccan and um, uh, north north and deccan so let's see what is the administration like of the guptas and the vakatakas uh, they were predominantly monarchical 
gupta rulers used grand titles like maharaja dirat parmeshwara they again stressed on the divinity of the kings they were devout vaishnavas and visually projected themselves as protectors of the realm hmm? the vakataka however uh, the rulers took much simpler titles like maharaja the prominent officer in the military department was a dandanayaka the introduced different grades of official hierarchy in the administration there was also appointment of high ranking officers on the hereditary basis and uh, one person working in several departments was a common feature of the administration there was also high demand of various kinds of taxes by this time uh, the 300 to 600 ad and of course it would be because they have to maintain uh, the uh, different regions and both kingdoms gupta and vakatakas were divided into provinces so this provincial system was now strongly um, uh, institutionalized in the sense it was strongly functioning and it was uh, used to control the region the empire or any kingdom uh, the provinces were designated as bhukti or desa the provincial governor was referred to as with the term uparika and the districts were known as vishaya or ahara so some scholars suggest that gupta administration was more decentralized Uh, than the modern administrative system and uh, the decentralization because of this decentralization it allowed presence of non governmental personages in the local administration so i'm sure you all know what centralization and decentralization mean uh, some decent in decentralization there is more scope for local officials the local governance happening with the help of local officials so the administration at the local or provincial level is not dependent on the center official or is not dependent on center central authority completely so this was one of the important features of these decentralizing aspect of the administration uh, during this period this was also seen as a marker of gradual decay of political control of and central of the central authority so because uh, this period is seen with predominance of decentralization a lot of historians and scholars who think that um, uh, india at this point of time was predominantly centralized and gradually it, uh, it uh, there was weakening of centralization and that led to the political decay and decentralization they go on that debate of uh, a gradual decay of political control from central authority now um, moving forward uh, the administration in post 600 ad now from about the 7th century ad the 6th century 7th century ad 7th century ad more uh, we consider that as the early medieval period now there are again presence of many political powers at this point of time mostly local and regional powers and there were little traces of non monarchical elements now most of these administ um, political powers were monarchical powers monarchy was now well established the polity often characterized as feudal now this is a very important debate that you'll be looking at gradually also in your uh, this semester and next semester you know uh, courses the polity of this particular period the 7th century till about the 12th century is characterized as feudal as opposed to a uh, centralized system yes so this is again the debate on feudalism is a very very important debate and it it comes in this period and historians are still um, um, uh, under um, um, they are they contesting uh, whether there was feudalism and not no feudalism and there are many historians who written around this uh, arya sharma arvans mukhya uh um, many so you can in fact if you're interested in reading you can read um the uh, you know references it's mentioned in in your um, suggested readings of e resource the, this entire feudalism debate that was important at this point point of time right now we don't have much time to go into the details maybe we'll uh, you know do this some other time but the polity often is characterized as feudal however no breakdown of crises in administrative or political organization was really seen the emergence of the samantas or the samanta system now again the word samant is is the feudal lord yes and the meaning of samantas kept changing over a period of time so what samantas were in the 7th century ad was different to samantas in the 12th century 10th century ad the relationship of samanta with his overlord was a significant facet of the post gupta polity and this system is considered as a hallmark of feudalism some suggest that the period between 600 to 1280 experienced major slump in commerce and this is primarily 
the region, reason attributed to this is feudalism, a process of weakening central authority and consequent rise of the Samantas. Uh, there was also sharp hierarchy in the ranks of Samantas. So this period is debated, the 600 to 1200 period, early uh, AD, uh, uh, 600 to 1200 AD, early medieval period is generally uh, contested as se and seen as a dark age or you know a major slump in commerce. Now again, some agree, some disagree. Please look at the details of the debate if you want to. Maybe we, you know, we can uh, help you with the debate some other day. But this period is generally seen as no central authority, and there were many things and many rulers uh, and many political powers parallelly um, uh, predominant in different parts of Indian subcontinent. Now, enormous increase in issuance of land grants brought two officers in prominence in the administration. One was the messenger, the duta. And the scribe, the Kayas. So these were they, these two became the most important um, uh, uh, officers uh, during in the administration and uh, administrative framework of this particular tea period. Sources are replete with terms used for revenue like bhog, bhag, kara, sulk. Regular taxes as well as all kinds of levies on local resources were also put into practice. Earlier practice of dividing the realm into provincial units continued in northern India. So we've looked at um, the administration in the post uh, six, uh, the post 600 period, early medieval period. Um, uh, let's look at the last uh, uh, theme of this particular block, law and judicial system. So now I haven't gone into the details of this. There are a lot of primary sources that your e-resource uh, booklet quotes please look at it there are three headings that this particular um, uh, unit uh, uh, is divided into sources of law and manu's uh, uh, texts and writings uh, are most important when uh, law is concerned the manusmriti manu mentions about different aspects of law the three sources of law that he mentions is the srot smart smart smarata and the sadachar Yanaval, Narada, and Brihaspati also writes about law and its various connotations. Please look at the details of what Brihaspati talks about law or Narada talks about law. These are all writers of the Vedic, um, post Vedic, um, you know, the, uh, the Smriti period. Um, um, uh, the, the period that we are discussing from earliest time to early medieval, these are uh, writers of that particular period who are talking about law and its various connotations. So please look at it from your e-resource. There's also classification of law uh, primarily into civil and criminal. Now, what comes in civil and what comes in criminal, under criminal, please look at it again from your e-resource. So a lot of description and examples that are given. And finally, the administration of justice. Now, this was the most important and essential part of protection to which people were entitled, entitled from the government. So the government uh, of any kind, monarchical, non-monarchical or whatever kind it may be, the most important function of the government is to protect its people. And to protect its people, they need a, um, um, some kind of a framework uh, for their justice, administration of justice. And there are a lot of judicial procedures that have specially been given by the Smriti writers. So uh, again, you can look at the details from the e-resource. So um, by and large, you know, in our entire uh, lecture, uh, you know, we've looked at um, the political structures in North India, administrative and institutional structures, both in the peninsula, Deccan, North India, uh, tracing it from the ancient period to the early medieval period. And uh, I would really uh, appreciate if you can um, um, look at, uh, 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 you know, your e-resource for more detail. I would uh, request, uh, so I, I would close my lecture uh, with this uh, with, uh, with this discussion. And if there's any question, again, I keep saying uh, you can ask right now or also write an email to me and I would reply to that. I hand it over to Dr. Shaheen for her comments. And if there is any question that uh, is there, I can take it up. Thank you so much. <coughs> Thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, such a beautiful uh, presentation and uh, very easy way you uh, you you explain everything uh, in a in a simple in a simple and uh, clear way. And uh, the best part uh, is the map. In every slide, say you have uh, presented a map and uh, the clear explanation of uh, the. Of, of the role of the Brahmins in peninsular India, the 
um, the the role of the uh, sangam polity and the sabha samiti there are various uh, various uh, various role played by different uh, uh, different uh, taxes also uh, and uh, so in the last uh, i would like to say that uh, the administrative and institutional system in north india during the early historical and early medieval period the political formation of the vedic period is generally regarded as a pre state or proto state quality with that the emergence of the janapadas the monarchical and oligarchical pattern came into existence and also the establishment of mauryan empire heralded the era of large monarchical states yes which which uh, elaborate the administrative mission missionary machinery and in the post mauryan period we see that uh, especially during the kushana period the notion of divine kingship became prevalent and in this period between 300 to 600 ad the guptas and the wakatakas dominated the political scene so their administrative system is uh, categorized as uh, decentralized Uh, which you explained uh, decentralized uh, so very well that uh, the, yes the administrative system is categorized as decentralized by many scholars and the polity of this period was predominantly monarchical and the, the samanta system is regarded as the hallmark of the post 600 political formation and also the last topic is the law and judicial system where the chanakyas arthashastras played a very important role so all this uh, all this information we, today we get uh, we are uh, so thankful to tripti deo ma'am because uh, in lockdown we are uh, we we feel ourselves so, so privileged and uh, so lucky to having you ma'am and in future i would request uh, to take uh, more classes on history okay ma'am thank you so much thank you now i am uh, requesting our technical expert uh, nishank purohit thank you for your uh, support and uh, now you can uh, end the session thank you so thank much you. thank Professor you mr mishra has something to say i guess hi nish today we have the audience to hear that doubt or something why you are in a hurry to end the session just one minute Actually, <laughs> actually, sir, sir, sir learners ha, did not have any questions. They did not have any questions. Audience may have. So sorry, 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 na. Okay. Thanks a lot for your brilliant lecture. Just I have one query because I couldn't clear my doubt. In Vedic times, there was sabha and samiti. I was trying to differentiate between sabha and samiti. So some sources they say sabha is for judicial function, samiti for religious function or religious resources. And in course of time, samiti went into oblivion. What is the essential difference between the sabha and samiti? And how do you visualize them? Uh. Doctor Shahin, can you repeat the question? I was I couldn't hear it a little properly from from Professor Mishra. If you have heard okay. it, can you just repeat it uh, for me? Uh, Ma'am, uh, sir is asking what is the difference between the sabha and uh, samiti. Am I? I am asking her, but just to clear some doubt, I mean, sabha is for judicial function, samiti is for religious function. so both you know the sabha both sabha and samiti yes uh, both sabha and samiti were actually um, uh, they were primitive assemblies and, and uh, but the difference between them maybe that those sabha and samiti they faded out subsequently so basically the sabha and samiti were attended by uh, uh, members of the clan and by the vedic raja as well as those uh, who were in power and um, um uh, they they were also to some extent uh, popular assembly so the the membership of sabha and samiti there was a difference in that the membership of sabha and samiti so it is difficult to ascertain really what was the real nature of these assemblies but um, uh, you know what historians have really mentioned is that uh, the samiti is a combination they both f- functioned uh, 
vis-a-vis -vis the political and cultural activities of the period. Um, there are uh, differences of opinion that who were a part of Sabha and who were a part of Samiti and who were a part of Vidhata. Vidhata, I think, uh, were um, the women were also allowed in that. Sabha was for all. And I think there was also Samiti. So again, what I'm seeing very neatly, there is no division um, uh, that has come as a consensus from historians. But there were um, early primitive assemblies that were um, involved in many in discussions over wealth, over social welfare, and all of that. So uh, I'm not I'm not particularly seeing uh, a very clean division is there uh, between Sabha, Samiti, and Vidhata because historians are still contesting that who belong to what. Like as a student of history about 10, 20 years back in school, I was told Sabha, these people were present. Samiti, these people were admitted. But I think there is an ongoing debate about what uh, and who were present. They were, they, they were by and large were prelim, prim, preliminary um, and primitive assemblies where discussions were taken taking place on the political and cultural uh, functions of the of of that particular region. Professor Mishra, I don't know whether I could make some sense. Yeah, I mean, you're all right. Somewhere else also I was reading that. Sparty is mainly for this entertainment purpose, dancing, gambling, all those things. And the king was present. But in Sabha, kings, I mean, were not present. So, anyhow, thank you very much, Sripti, for your brilliant lecture. And you will be, we'll be seeing you quite often in future. Thank you very much. Now, Dr. Sahin, you can end the session. Okay. Thank you, Professor Mishra. हेलो मैम आप अनम्यूट होके बोलिए साइन मैडम अनम्यूट होके ओके हेलो मैम जी हेलो हेलो हियर वी हैव वन स्टूडेंट प्रमोद कुमार सो आई एम रिक्वेस्टिंग हिम इफ ही हैव एनी एनी क्वेश्चन ही कैन आस्क यू डायरेक्टली प्रमोद कुमार आर यू लिसनिंग टू मी हेलो Hello. Okay. Uh, okay. I think he did not have any questions. Are we are we having another uh, audience from other department from English? She is Heba Farin, and uh, and I, I am I am requesting her if she having any questions, she can ask you directly. Heba. Um, good afternoon, ma'am. It was re really a wonderful session. I belong to a different department. I am of English department, yet I am um, attending your session because I like your session very much, and it's quite uh, insightful and quite knowledgeable too. So thanks a lot, ma'am, for you. having such session. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay thank you, ma'am. Okay, Dr. Shane. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Namaskar. Now we can end this.